I'd like to say good evening to everyone who has joined us in our weekly Bible class from St. James Cumberland Presbyterian Church in America. St. James is located in Decatur, Alabama on 920 West Moulton Street. We are the church that's preparing for the promised return of Christ by in reach, trying to build each other up with Bible studies, uh, prayer and worship, outreach, trying to spread the good news of the gospel to those who are unchurched and those who are in places where the gospel is not being preached. And upreach, we can't do anything without God, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit assisting us. We know that we are in and of ourselves nothing, but with him we can do all things. So with that, we're going to move into our Bible class. We are studying in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, Philippians. And which, this week we're in chapter 2. So open your Bibles and join us as we study the word of, of the Lord. Let us pray together. Holy and everlasting Father, we thank you for giving us another day, Father, and for allowing us to have the privilege to share in the ministry that you are performing in the earth today, Father. And Lord, we admit, we admit on our own we can't do this, Father. But Lord, you say you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So Lord, we need you. To, we invite you in to take full control. Lord, anoint us and help us, Father, to be instruments that, that are fit for you to use, Father, that you can Get glory and honor out of the things that we are saying and doing, Father. Open your word up to us, and Lord, give us a clear understanding and appreciation for what you're teaching today, Father. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise, glory, and honor that you deserve. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're in Philippians, and Paul, uh, at this time, is thought to be in Rome in jail. Paul said he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's he's there because he's doing the work of the Father. We have, we have to know that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. And they have different uh they are different but they are one. They they are united in purpose and and so Paul uh, felt called to go to Macedonia. He had a vision from God. A man appeared to him in a vision saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So on his second missionary journey, uh, he arrived in this area and he went to Philippi. And when he left uh, the vessel that he was sailing in, he found women who gathered around the seaside to pray. So Paul opened up the word of God to these women. And Lydia, who was a very industrious lady, she, the Bible says she was a seller of purple. She heard the word and she accepted it as true and and gave our life to God. And she became a safe haven for Paul and those who were selling with him. She opened a house to them and they continue studying the word of God. Uh, of course, every time we do good, if you, if you go into Acts, you, you can see that Paul was doing a great work in Philippi, but then there was a woman who was possessed by a demon that was following Paul around saying, these are the men of the most high God. The demon had the woman saying the right thing, but we don't need the devil testifying for us. So Paul cast the demon out of the woman and the men in the city got upset because they were making money from this woman. So Paul, I said it to say this now, don't be discouraged when you're doing a good work for God and you are attacked by the enemy. And sometimes he can come in different forms. Uh, uh, many times he chooses to use the people who are closest to us. But we have to recognize that they are just the vessels 
our real enemy is Satan. So this particular book, uh, the overall theme of this book is, is exhortation for meekness in unity. So Paul is trying to exhort us uh, to live a life of meekness and unity with God and with our brothers and sisters. So Paul starts this letter out letting them know that he is a prisoner from Rome and, and he's trying to let them know that even though he's in jail, don't let that mess your mind up because uh, he's there for Christ and God is even using him while he is behind, uh, while he's bound. He wasn't necessarily behind bars, but he was restricted uh, and he was uh, held, but he had freedom. And because he was in this predicament, the people who were responsible for, for keeping him, uh, they were hearing the gospel and their lives were being transformed. And Paul got a chance to appear before the Roman officials and share the word of God. And their lives were being changed. And then he had so much freedom until the people in the community, when they heard about this man and when they heard about what he was teaching and preaching, they had access to Paul. So we have to realize that anywhere that God allowed us to be is an opportunity for us to glorify God. You know, sometimes we're in places that we don't really want to be. We find ourselves in, in situations that are not in the eyes of human beings favorable. At times we're even persecuted and we have to suffer. But even in our suffering, we have to use our experience as an opportunity to glorify God because God is in control of all circumstances. And if he allow us to be in circumstances, he can get glory out of our lives. And so wherever we are, whatever state we find ourselves in, Paul, we are finding in this book as we continue to study, he said, I've learned to be content in any situation that I find myself in. We can be content if we're sold out to the God that saved us. So we're gonna continue our study of Philippians. And last week we moved into the second chapter. And I'm gonna go back and read uh, the first few verses where we study. He said, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassions, fulfill ye my joy. It should be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I feel like it's important for us to look at this again so that we can go into uh, the passage of scripture that we are dealing with and see where, why Paul uh, was able to make the, this declaration and exhortation. He's saying that uh, the reason why I'm going to say what I'm going to say is because of the consolation in Christ. We are consoled by Christ because we were in a situation where we were alienated from a God that created us and we had a bad uh bad conclusion ahead of us, but Christ did what was necessary to redeem us back to God. He said, if there's any love, uh, if there's any comfort in love, we because Christ loved us, we can be confident. Uh, and
And then he sent the Holy Spirit to be our comforter. Then he said, in the fellowship of the Spirit, that's what the Spirit does. When we allow ourselves to die in the flesh, then the Holy Spirit can have power in our lives. So uh, we ought to be always in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and he'll guide us in the way that God would have us to live our lives. And then he said, if any tender mercies and compassions, if, if you know, that's, that's what the Spirit should bear in us. Uh, we, have, we have mercy because of God, and we ought to show mercy toward one another. We ought to have compassion and love for God and for each other. Paul said, fulfill ye my joy that we be like-minded. We shouldn't have all different kinds of agendas. God has given us the overall agenda that he has for his church. And that's to build each other up and to spread the good news of the gospel. So everyone should be focused on carrying out the mission that God has given us. He's saying, saying uh, fulfill ye my joy. Be like-minded. Be of the same love. Be on one accord. Be of one mind. That's how we can come together. If we're all focused on the love of God and we are, we are all focused on the mission that he has given us. And then he said, let nothing be done through strife. We don't have, have time to be pulling against one another. Uh, we ought to be coming together to accomplish the mission. Somebody had to carry out the mission for us to get to know God. Somebody had to guide us as we matured as Christians. Uh, God has fixed it to where we needed one another. So we don't have time to be pulling against one another. And then he said, vainglory. We don't have time to be trying to make a name for ourselves. We need to be raising the name of Jesus. Uh, in and of ourselves, we're nothing. It's in, in him that we live and we move and we have our being. So our whole being, everything that we are, and everything that we have was given to us by God. And, and, if, and if God doesn't keep our minds, uh, we won't even know that we're in the world. We won't even know our name. So we have to realize that we are totally and completely dependent on God. So we shouldn't be trying to glorify ourselves. We ought to be trying to glorify God. And he is saying uh, that we ought, to, uh, we ought to be lowliness in mind. Let us esteem others better than we ourselves. If you're going to carry out the mission of God, if you're going to come after Christ, he said, you got to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. That's what Christ did. Uh, and so we're going to see all this is, is leading into what we're going to talk about today. He said, look not every man to his own things, but every man to the things of others. So we can't be selfish and be following Christ. We can't be looking, trying to make a name for ourselves, trying to enrich ourselves. God is going to take care of us, but we have to take care of his business. So that's what Paul is saying. That's what he's leading into. Uh, we have to be uh, meek. We have to be thinking about the welfare of others. We have to, we can't be selfish. We got to have love. So with that, we, we're moving into Christ as being our example of what, what Paul has been saying in this chapter. Verse 5 said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 2 said, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So, Everything that we talked about from the beginning, how we ought to live our lives, Christ set the example. He went before us and he, he, he set the example. Paul said, let this mind that was in Christ be in us. That's, that's how Christians should carry themselves. That's how 
we ought to live our lives like Christ did. Christ, while he was on this earth as a man, was God also. He never lost his power. He never lost his authority. Uh, he was, he's always been God. And he always will be God. Once again, he never lost his power, never lost his authority, never lost his, his divinity. Uh, he always has been God and always will be God. But because we got in trouble, he came to be our brother. He allowed himself to be wrapped up in flesh. Came in the womb of Mary. We're, we're, we're moving into the Christmas season. And the Bible says that Jesus, uh, God sent Gabriel to a virgin by the name of Mary, who was a spouse to Joseph. But they had never come together. They, they had never come together physically. They had pledged themselves to one another. But God came to her, and, and uh, he put his seed in this virgin. So man had nothing to do with the comp composition of Jesus. Uh, sin passed down from Adam all the way down to Joseph. Joseph was still a descendant of Adam. Even though he was Christ's earthly father, uh, he had nothing to do with how he came into this world. God came to Joseph. But Joseph was ready to put Mary away quietly. But he came to him and told him that the thing that has happened to her was divine. God was the one who impregnated Mary. So he was all God and he was all man. He was man so much until he could get tired, he could get hurt. Uh, he understood our experience as man, but he was still God. Jesus always had been God. In John, the 10th chapter, the 30th verse, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So he had flesh, but he was still God. He was still fully connected to his Father. Uh, John 12, 45 said, he said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. We have to realize that the, the Trinity are three persons, but they are so closely connected with love until they're one. There are no divisions in them. That's the, that's the way God wants us to live. We don't have to be just like one another, but we have to have enough love so that we won't let our differences cause us to be divided in purpose. We ought to have the same mission. That's what the Trinity has. Uh, if you go over to John, the first chapter, he said, in the beginning was the Word. So Christ was there before God ever created this world. He, he said, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and, and the light was light of man. So Christ... Uh, was with God before the world was ever created. But then he said, the word became flesh and he dwelt among him. John said, I, we beheld this glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Came unto his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them he became, he gave the, the power to become the, glory, the, the sons of God. If you look at, at Colossians 2 and 9, I just want to establish that he was God, but yet he was man. He said, in him, Christ, the one that was born from Mary, who was the Son of God, God's only begotten Son, in him dwelled the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he didn't come less than what he always had been. He was God, and he didn't think of robbery to be equal with God. God even testified that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit testified by coming down in the bodily form of a dove when he was baptized by John. So he was God, all God, all man. So he 
said he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But then verse 7 said he made of himself no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Once again, we're in the Christmas season. And Christ came to be our kinsman redeemer. We had to have another man because we offended God in the flesh. And throughout the Old Testament, God gave shadows and types of how he was going to bring us back to himself. He had him to bring lambs and different animals uh, to atone for our sins. It, and, and they were not the perfect atonement, but they were telling a story. The Bible said they were shadows and types of how God was going to bring us back to himself. And he asked him to bring a lamb without a spot or a blemish. Don't just bring me anything. Uh, Cain got in trouble because he brought something that was unacceptable to God. And Abel brought something that was acceptable to God. And God told him that you, know, you don't have to be upset. Just do like you're supposed to do. If you don't, if you don't do that, well, sin is at your door and, and you, you, you're headed toward trouble. So, so we have to realize that God will not just accept anything. So that means that no one could qualify bringing us back in right relationship with God. We needed another man. Uh, John saw this picture in heaven and he, and, uh, he saw the, the, the scroll with the seven seals and no man was worthy in heaven, no man on earth, no man under the earth. And John started to cry, but he said, don't cry. As a lamb, as if he was slain before the foundation of the world, who has prevailed to open the books and to read the writing thereof. That's Jesus. So Jesus came in the form of man. But he didn't come insisting and demanding the respect that he deserved. He was God. Uh, and he could have demanded the best that he that the world had to offer because he's God. He get, he, he he came from royalty. Uh, he came from uh, having everything. But one scripture said he emptied himself. Now, that, that doesn't mean that he emptied himself of power, of authority, of divinity, but he chose to set those things aside. Uh, to do what he needed to do to bring us back in the right, right relationship with God. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve a purpose, and that was to redeem us back to our Father. In Second Corinthians, he said, we know the grace of God, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, that through his poverty, we might be rich. So, he came for us. Came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Scripture said, God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So, Christ came to give us that eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that's what he was to us. He, uh, he made of himself of no reputation. Many times people would say, aren't you Joseph's son? Uh, we know who your brothers are. Uh, we know Jew. We know uh, James. We know uh, that, that you, you are a peasant. And some of them even wanted to say that you are an illegitimate child of, jo of Joseph. But Christ allowed himself to suffer for our sake and to be rejected, looked down on for us. That's the kind of mind we need to have. We don't need to demand so much fanfare and recognition. 
we should be allowing our uh, Christ to be recognized through what we're doing for him rather than us being recognized because he did this, did that for us. But then it, verse 8 said, being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient under death, even the death of the cross. That's as low as you can go. The Bible said that he became sin for us. That through his righteousness, we can become the righteousness of God in him. That's love. Christ said, no man is taking my life. But I'm choosing to lay it down. And if I lay my life down, I'll be able to pick it up again. He had a mission to re reunite us back to God. And he did it in the lowest form that man could do. The, that cross, the Bible said, cursed is any man that hangs on a tree. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 1 and 2, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily beset us. Let us run this race with patience, uh, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised in the same and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. So for our benefit, he endured the cross. He's the author and he's the finisher of our faith. While he was hanging on the cross, he was able to declare that it is finished. I've already done everything necessary uh, to redeem you back to God. Now all you got to do is, is come through me. He said, I am the door to the sheep. Oh. By me, if any man enter in, he'll find pastors and go in and out. So he is the access to God. No man can come to the Father but by me. He did everything. He bought our pardon on the cross. Uh, he finished everything that God prophesied that would happen. Christ fulfilled all the laws, all the prophecy. It, they were all nailed to that cross. That's what Colossians tells us. He took all, all that out of our way. Now he ushered in grace. We can come to the God by faith. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy in our time of need. So Christ fulfilled the mission. Let this mind be in you. If Christ did all that for us, we ought to be willing to live for him. We ought to be willing to... Uh, sacrifice for our brothers and sisters because we are called to continue the work that he started. We're called to do the things that he did while he was here. We can't die for man's sin, but we can live for God. We can live for one another. Christ gave his life for people who were sinners, who were alienated from him. He was the one that, that was the victim by, of, of uh, us walking away from him. But he loved us too much to keep us in an alienated position. So he came for us, came to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. We are saved because we came and we accepted this gift. But And, and we're not doing what we're doing trying to be saved. Christ accomplished that. He gave us that gift. But we're saved because we appreciate it. And we, we're working because we appreciate what he did for us. And that's what he has called us to do. As we uh, saved, we ought to be concerned about the well-being of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Every day of our lives, as we encounter people, we ought to be trying to show them the love of Christ. I know that many of them 
are undeserving of the love that we're showing them. But you know what helps me? I think about how I don't deserve all the blessings that, blessings that God has given me. Every day of my life, I keep on blessing me in spite of myself. You might fool yourself and think that you're so holy. But even the bad thoughts that pass through our heads and, and this flesh that we're wearing, uh, we have not overcome the flesh yet. We're still battling. That's where the biggest fight that we have is. It's not with each other. Uh, Paul said, every, every time I would do good, evil is always present. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. So uh, we have the Holy Spirit working on the inside of us, but this flesh is warring against the Spirit. So we're working for, because we appreciate what he gave us. Not because we're so holy that we are going to be saved, but the blood of Jesus Christ accomplished that. And now we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, bringing us into compliance with God. So we need to appreciate the privilege that God has given us through his son. We're going to continue uh, in verse 9, and we're going to see the exhortation of Jesus uh, next week. Let's continue to walk with God, even though we're separated physically from one another. We can still be connected spiritually. Every week, we're going to up upload a Bible class trying to keep us connected with one another and with God. And keeping our spiritual strength up. If you don't eat food every day, your body will get weak. It is the same with our spirit. If we don't stay in the word of God and feeding on the word, we'll get weak. Every Sunday morning at 945, we're going to continue teaching Sunday school as we were when we were coming together in our fellowship hall and in our classrooms. We are up, we will upload. Bible class by Elder Thomas. He's been doing a beautiful job. Then at 11 o'clock, we will have a message. So let's continue to stay connected. God has blessed us with social media so that we can uh, see each other through our spirit and, and the connection and studying of the word and the hearing of preaching. So pray for me and as I'm praying for you that we can con continue to do the work of God even in this pandemic. And God is going to lift this pandemic from us eventually. But let's try to understand why he allowed it to happen. He, he could have stopped it. But I just believe that we got too comfortable. Got easy, at ease in Zion. Not that we, wasn't, we were doing so badly, but we need to give our lives to him. He said, or to love God with all our hearts, all our souls, all our strength, all of our minds. So let's not get distracted. Let's stay connected as close as we can to God, that we might be able to fulfill the mission of getting the harvest in for him. Let us pray. Holy and everlasting Father, we thank you for the privilege of being a part of your family. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from destruction. Thank you for the avenues that you've given us to continue to try to minister to your people, Father. And Lord, we ask you, Father, to anoint what we're doing. Lord, let your word go past these sinful flesh and this sinful flesh that we're wearing and, and minister to your people, Father. And Lord, we're praying for those who are sick right now, people are sick of the COVID virus, Father, and, and other ailments. You are able to heal. I know that you have the power to do so. You haven't lost any power at all. So, Lord, we're praying for healing. We're praying for those who are uh, laying their lives on the line, trying to take care of those who are, have the virus, Father. We ask you to protect them and give them the wisdom to properly treat the patients, Father. 
And Lord, we're praying, Father, for those who have lost loved ones, Father, and are grieving right now. I know that you're the only one that can bring comfort in times of bereavement, Father. We all can gather around and try to support, and we ask you to, to work through us, but you're the one that can, can heal the pain and fill the void, Father. And Lord, we're praying for the Christian army, Father. We are in a position now that many people could get weak, Father. But Lord, help us, Father, to support one another. And Lord, we ask you to strengthen us as we are apart physically, Father. And let us stay connected to you and to one another. And Lord, let the Holy Spirit touch hearts that are, have not given themselves to you yet, Father. And bring them under conviction that they might come to you for a saving knowledge of you, Father. Everything that we're doing, Father, we're not trying to raise our name. We want your name to be glorified through our lives. We thank you, Father, for the privilege. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. May God richly bless and keep you is my prayer.